we're back. I like this hook. You got a book you want to tell us about? Well, let's talk. There's no other place to do it. I want a young cast of craze. Cast the craze. Then go and start working. You know, and it, it's tough. It, it really is hard. And a lot of people give up because it just gets to be too hard, you know. And I've talked to a lot of guys who work, man. There's a gentleman, and again, we're not naming any names, Thanks. but he, dude, he's working at like three o'clock in the morning just drawing or doing something because there's just no time during the day, you know. And like a lot of times, though, you know, relationships will fail because of it. But that works for him. So he, he's figured out the time frame where he can be all in, right. which is unobstructed, which exactly. is his, de- his time, and he can focus mm-hmm. on his craft. That's right. So you got to figure out what works for you. Yeah. You know, I, we traveled, I mean, I, I'll throw his name out. We traveled with Brian Kahn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brian Kahn is a beast. Yeah. You know, he is a master of discipline. He, will, he has dedicated unlimited time to his craft, but still finds a time for his wife and his child um, yeah, and children. Um, you know, so I've, I've we've traveled with him to conventions, and you know, we'd be at the hotel, and he's on the floor till three in the morning, four in the morning. We've been out partying, you know. So we spent the whole day at the at the con. We're back at you know, we're going out partying. We're back at the hotel. He's on the floor, st- drawing commissions nonstop. What time is your best time to work? When do you think you're the most productive? Uh, the when I'm most productive. Yeah, I mean. Not at work. Not when you're working your regular job. I'm talking about like creating. When are you the most productive as far as creating goes? I'm most productive. For me, it all depends on what the discipline is. So if I'm writing, mm-hmm. it's usually in the afternoon. Really? Um, uh, yes. Um, for me, it's... But when I'm illustrating, it's at night. Um, um, I find that uh, I've had... I, you know, I've worked all day. I came home, had dinner with the wife took care of all that stuff, and then I walk up to the office and try to draw um, and create. And um, whether it's just thumbnailing out pages until I get a groove and then I get a good feel for what I want, or it's um, full page, you know. But I find in the evenings I've, 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 I'm, more, I'm creative because what happens is I have a routine in the morning. Um, I get up at 4.30 in the morning and... First thing I do is feed the dogs, take them out, clean up their mess. Um, my pre-workout drink, I work out. Get ready, I go to work. I listen to motivational podcasts. I listen to like, um, whether it's, if it's not motivational podcasts, I'll listen to interviews with Joe Rogan. Or if it's not that, then I'm just listening to um, um, you know, like uh, interviews on Vlad TV and stuff like that. Um, just to get going in a day. And then during the day, I can't do it in the morning. For some reason, in the morning, I'm not creative. But so throughout the day, it's almost as if my imagination's been working all day. You know, my creative juice is flowing. I'm relaxed. And um, that's when I can do it. What about you? It's, it's weird, man. It's like I'm most creative at work. <laughs> like during those hours is when I feel like sometimes I'll be working and an idea will strike. And I just, you, literally, you stop and like, if you, if like for example, writing... I'll write down, like I'll write down ideas and things like that because that's when they're in my head. And then, like you said, it's true. It depends on the discipline. So like if I'm lettering a book or if I'm, you know, doing those kind of things, those technical things, designing something, those things I can do at night, whether it's in front of a TV, while something's in the background, while I'm creating. Because writing for me is hard to do when there's noise in the background. You know, I can't, I, I can't do it. I can't, if there's something in the background, I can't jot down ideas or, or, or do any kind of writing, you know? Right. And I get it. You know, and, it, and again, mm-hmm. it's, it's, for me, I try to dedicate, like, the past couple months has been dedicated to education, um, learning the podcast, because I have an artist that's drawing the book for Forbidden. Mm-hmm. So for me, it was just writing the script um, and getting that out to him um, at the same, t- and then also going back and forth with some edits. But um, the biggest thing was learning the new technology for podcasting, uh, live streaming, um, learning the new technologies, um, the new mixer equipment, all that stuff. So I spent a lot of time with my education because if we're going to do, again, do it right. 
Um, and every day we learn, you know, even like today, you know, I just, we, we learn something, you know, and hit the record button. Yes. 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 <laughs> yes. Maria, and my, you know, my A&R people, yeah, where are I you? Mean. Right. So, um, <laughs> but I think the best, the biggest thing is when we did the podcast 10 years ago, it was just microphone mixers and audacity. Now it's cameras um, um, mixers with pre-recorded intervals, you know, commercials, you know, flashy things coming up on the screen, all this crazy stuff, right? So, I don't, we don't have a production person that's sitting here. So as we're talking, I'm actually doing all the transitions, and that's what I mean. It, it's it, it, we want to give the best show for you, um, but that means that meant that I had to make a deal at home and say, hey. I need to put in this many hours a day to be able to do this. So that meant research. When I w- when we d- we had the conversation back in earlier this year and about relaunching Catch the Craze, now I had to do research, right? Which cameras have the best, you know, uh, resolution? Um, which mixers? I can't. I, I tell you, I went to Sam Ash Music Store and I ordered the uh, R- Rodeo um, mixer, and uh, that's the first time they've seen it. They're like, "What is this?" And I was like, look, it has all these great fade in, fade out buttons, all this stuff, whatever. I can take a live caller with the, um, with the phone. It's Bluetooth. It's all these great um, features on it, but I had to learn how to use it, right? It's just a tool. It, the tool is only as good as you use it. And that means I had to commit. And my wife was very good with that. Even when I was in Texas this weekend, I was working. I was working on the, uh, the images that you see on the screen. Um, you know, so I think that's, you, got, you have to put in the time. Um, I don't know how to say it any differently. Yeah, no, it's okay to have aspirations. It's just not okay to, to, to put into work. And it's not okay to blame somebody else for your lack of commitment. And I think that's the biggest thing. You know, I never be, I made a decision to walk away from the game. Um, you know, I was relentless on fighting. And, and even now, like, I know that everything I'm doing today is, is for next year. It's for tomorrow, right? So I'm realistic now. Um and I understand the, the sacrifices I have to make and the commitment level I have to make and, and all this stuff. And I mean, and, and the commitment level that George has to make, um, you know, because he's coming from New York, you know, uh, to do the show here in New Jersey. Um, so I think those are the things that uh, I think the re- I thought it was a great conversation is, you know, again, ask yourself, what am I willing to give up? What am I willing to do? And what am I not willing to do? Right. And again, I always say it and I say it to um, my team. Um, in my full, my real world job is if your left column of what am I not willing to do is greater than your right column of what am I willing to do, give it up. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, makes sense. <laughs> you know, and I think <laughs> you can't half ass it. You know, you have to, it's you're in or you're out, you know? Yeah. And, um, so I think that's it. So, so I think before. I think before we get into this mindset of, well, no one gives us a fair shot because we're independent. No, no, man, I can name dozens of people who broke the broke ground and made it because they they went all in and they were relentless and uh, um, and you know they wouldn't accept no for an answer. Um, and that's where you have to be. All of us have to be um, and be realistic. You know, it's great to have aspirations, but your timeline and your commitment level have to be in line with it. Absolutely. You know. Amen. Amen. Do we, do we, uh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, for my next act. Uh, um, all right. Well, do you want to introduce the uh, the new uh, segment to the show? Yeah, we're have, going to uh, have we're going to have. Um, uh, let's see. What's his name? J M. DeSantis. There you go. Desantis. Um, hold on. And uh, so I've noticed that he just did some signing or some appearance at... Uh, yeah, I was there at uh, Barnes & Noble. You were there? Yeah. In, nice. Uh, in, in Princeton. How'd it go? It was great, man. It was, it's nice, man. It was great to see it. it uh, actually, I have a copy of his book with me. Uh, this is it right here. It's uh, Robert Phillips. That's the name of the book. And uh, check it out. Yeah, he, he was signing these over at the, uh, at the Barnes & Nobles in, uh, in Princeton. And it was a nice turnout. They actually kept some books at the uh, at the uh, store, signed books at the store. So if you're in Princeton, New Jersey, and you're at the Barnes and Nobles, I'm not exactly sure what the location is. We'll ask them. Um, I'm sure you can go by there and pick up some books. 
Yeah, he's doing some good things. So, is Darkfire Press his yes. company? Yeah, okay, his good. Company. Yep. Wow. So, gonna, the, oh, there's a lot of great questions we can ask him today. Absolutely. I'm gonna I'm gonna have him call in uh, right now. So. Yeah. But yeah, no, he um yeah he's uh he's got a, a book um, that he entitled 10, 10 years of basically his work, the stuff that he's done in the last ten years. He compiled it in one book and it's actually selling it. He's uh he's doing convention appearances and things like that. So yeah, he's uh he's very good, man. Very good. The book is actually very good too. It's uh, and I'll have him talk about it. But yeah, he's uh, he's all in on that stuff. So this is a reprint of a of somebody else's work. So I will have him as okay. Yes, yeah, because I'm, I'm reading this. No, um, it, and I'm like, it, you'll see when he tells you what it is, you're gonna right. be like, oh wow, that's cool. Because he it's that he's definitely thought this thing out. Like you know how you had the Bible. For all your stories, you have like a Bible with characters. So right. He's his approach to writing is the same thing. Like he'll have tons of just stuff, uh. and work, and like that he basically puts in I'm into calling. it. And there he is. Yeah. Hello there. Hey. JM, what's up, buddy? Hey, George, how you doing? Good, good. Welcome to the show, man. This is J.M. DeSantis. You're on with uh, my friend Sam Vera, J.M. All right, cool. Nice to uh, nice to be talking to you too, Sam. Oh, welcome to Catch the Craze. And uh, we're pretty excited to have you on. And, um, you know, George is going to um, talk to you about your recent uh, appearance at Barnes & Nobles. I thought that was pretty exciting. So, uh, George, you want to take it away? Yeah, we were, we were actually just talking, J.M., about the book Robert Phillips. And it's funny okay. because... Sam opens up the book and he asks a question. He said, wait, is this a reprint of, a, of another book? And so do you want to tell us a little bit about what Robert Phillips is and how you came up with the idea? Right. Well, I mean, I wrote the book uh, like 11 years ago. It was, um, I was doing a lot of Lovecraft work at the time. Robert Phillips is a, is a Lovecraftian novella so it's based in uh, sort of H.P. Lovecraft's world. You know, it takes place in Arkham and uh, Miskatonic University. Um a lot of it, at least. And, yeah, I mean, like, originally the book was just a first-hand account uh, of the narrator, who is a friend of uh, title character Robert Phillips. Um, and I guess, you know, telling uh, about the book, it's, you know, he um, he's a linguistics um, uh, student, although in the original draft, uh, I kept changing his major because I kept changing my mind to how I wanted the uh, book to go. Um, but yeah, he, um, <clears throat> he wants to get access to the Necronomicon at Miskatonic University because he thinks, uh, or he has this theory that there's translation errors in the, in the book, which is, is pretty common with anything, especially when, according to H.P. Lovecraft's, uh, history of the Necronomicon, there's, uh, it changes, uh, when it starts in Arabic and then it's translated to Greek and then to Latin and then to English. So you would definitely have translation errors, and the uh, the college denies him access because uh, the novella takes place about five to ten years after a lot of the events of H.P. Lovecraft stories. Um, so you know, there's there's a lot of things that have happened surrounding the book, and um, Robert Phillips kind of starts going on this uh, kind of this descent into mag madness as he. Uh, gets obsessed with the idea of uh, trying to get access to the book. But, um, yeah, I mean, in the original draft, his um, his friend didn't have, I mean, trying to bring this back to the, the reprint, uh, saying his friend didn't have a name, and I didn't have this idea of, um, you know, the book being reprinted. In fact, it didn't have any of the footnotes in it or anything. But when I went to go... Um, you know, rewrite it. And the first half is what needed the most work. Right. Um, yeah, I added in all this other stuff and it just kind of became the story within the story right. because, uh, I thought it would be pretty cool if I, you know, added in this bit where, yeah, like, you know, the original publisher burned down for the book and, you know, it was just almost like this book that I found and provided to, uh, dark fire press to, to reprint, you know, 
So it's funny. I get a, I get a lot of people, even if they know I wrote the book, they're like, I, I don't get it though. Who, who wrote the book? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Which is, I think, so, what, which is, I think, what Sam's question was. Like, wait, who? So wait, he rewrote. Like, he, what's going on here? You know? Yeah. No, I, I really tried to like, you know, kind of give this immersive experience with the, the book in, in that respect. Um, you know, because I, I like. Um, I like stories to feel as real as they possibly can. So, you know, kind of presenting them as these real accounts, even though it's, it's fictional, you know, I think that really helps bring the reader in. I, I did a similar thing with my comic character, Chadiana, right. with one of the first stories I mentioned, sort of like she was this character of legend. And I, I had a few people that thought I found like this Indian this obscure Indian uh, mythological character that, you know, and I started writing stories about her, but, you know, not the case. I created her. So, um, but yeah, same thing with this. I just, you know, thought, well, you know, uh, there's, um, it, I guess there aren't too many writers other than Lovecraft, I guess a little bit of uh, Tolkien mm -hmm. that kind of present the fiction as fact. Right. But I have seen it done in some video games where it's just, you know, it's just right off the bat, it's kind of like talking about this as, as if it's historical fact. And um, I just think it's a cool device to, to kind of, I guess, set it up with a, a white lie almost, like, you know. Yeah, no, definitely. Taking for granted that it's, uh, yeah, it's real. Yeah, no. And, and you know what? I, I meant to ask you this because I remember when we went to, because when I went to the signing over at, uh, at the Barnes and Nobles, and, and actually, you know what? Before I even go to my next question, the book Robert Phillips, they have yeah. copies of the book at the uh, Princeton um, Barnes and Nobles, right? Right. I, I I guess it's only a limited amount because right. you know they they just put in an order and whatever sold at the signing. Yeah, they had five author copies, which I don't like. I don't know if they've sold those or not because it's like they buy the books for the signing, right? So, like, I just know how many books they bought. I don't know when they sold after that, you know, because, um, but yeah, they, um, yeah, they have about five, possibly still five uh, signed author copies, although I can hope they all got sold. Yeah. And, um, you know, it was ever left over from the order, too, you know. Well, that's awesome, man. Congratulations on that. that. That was uh, pretty impressive to see, you know, that whole setup, and it was great. It was nice. It was a nice night to be there and just be able to, um, see you do that now you mentioned yeah. you mentioned lovecraft as, as you know an inspiration for for the book what got mm -hmm. you into that into that uh into that author like what 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 was your first i guess introduction to him well that's a funny thing because i i didn't like lovecraft right off the bat <laughs> <laughs> um so it was kind of like I, I remember, um, this is when I was like in late high school. Um, cause when I was in high school, I didn't read a lot. Um, I read when I was a kid and then I just kind of went through this phase where I wasn't reading many books, but you know, video games were more of a thing that I, I did and paid attention to storytelling wise. But then, you know, I started wanting to get back into, um, reading and I remember looking, I wanted to find like as many source old sources as I could for like, um, you know, the, the origins of fantasy and stuff like that. So of course I started with Tolkien cause that was, you know, I guess at the time that's the, the furthest back I could go. And, you know, just all through college, I was reading uh, both fiction and myths and really like old, um, old medieval texts and old dark age texts and stuff like that translated. I mean, I wasn't reading the original language, but, right, 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 right. you know, I mean, I know a little bit about languages and the structure and how they work and stuff like that. But I, you know, I, English is about the only one I know yeah. well enough. So but, you, um, yeah, well, I was going to say, so what happens is when you're reading all these different books and all these, you know, uh, from all these different sources, right. maybe not the historical ones, but you know, like, authors' names keep coming up. You know, somebody will write an inter introduction to a book and they'll reference this person and they'll reference that person. And actually what happened was Robert E. Howard's name kept coming up, who's the creator of Conan. Right. 
So I got into Robert E. Howard, and Lovecraft's thing came up like a few times, but then finally it was like my senior year in college. Yeah, I, yeah, um, I finally got to, uh, to Lovecraft, and the first collection I read of his is a Del Grey collection called The Best of H.P. Lovecraft, and I gotta be honest, like, I read almost the entire thing feeling like I really, like he, like I knew at that point from a little bit of reputation of reading about him, that he was like, you know, considered one of the greatest um, horror authors, Mm -hmm. but, and I like really dense, dry, um, heavy narrative uh, literature, because I read a lot of old Victorian stuff, Mm -hmm. but yeah, like I read his and I was just thinking, this guy, I, I don't care. (laughs) <laughs> you know, like, I just can't get into it. Right. Um, it wasn't until after I finished that first collection, and then I guess, like, it kind of stuck with me. You know, like, I kept thinking back to a lot of the stories. Right. That I thought, like, oh, you know what? Like, something about it, though, like, it's still kind of sticking with me. Oh, so, yeah, that's the long version. No, no. You I'm always going to have a long version of the story. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's interesting, man. Because no, you know what it is? We, we're all, I mean, at the end of the day, a lot of us are inspired by other artists, whether you're, if you're, you're a writer, you know, whoever you're mm-hmm. inspired by. If you like, I have a friend who, who loves horror and he likes to write horror and his inspiration behind the horror is, you know, it's uh, Stephen King, you know? So like, yeah. we're always mm-hmm. inspired by somebody who kind of like, we start, we, we kind of, I don't want to say that we try to copy, but I'm going to use the word emulate these uh these authors and things like that. So that makes yeah. sense. Well, it's a funny thing about Lovecraft though. And I think that's why it stuck with me is because there's certain things about Lovecraft. There's some ways that like, I feel I'm the polar opposite of Lovecraft because he was like a horrible racist in life. And you know, yeah, I right. probably would, I probably would have had an argument with the guy and knocked him out. <laughs> but I mean, but on the other hand, uh, there's certain things about him that I kind of related to. Like, he really liked old literature as well. Um, it, surprisingly, I, I also find this a little bit weird, too, is, like, even considering what I just said about his, uh, his opinions of anybody that wasn't white, he was really into the Arabian Nights. I know that was, like, a big inspiration for him, and it's not quite the same thing, but... Because, right. I mean, uh, Chadian is a uh, South Asian Indian, but... So there's kind of that. He likes the, you know, again, he's really in, he was really into old literature. And a lot of his, uh, at least in the Cthulhu mythos, a lot of the creatures are kind of, um, how do you say, like, you know, they kind of have like this under underwater, like this um, yeah. oceanic kind of feel to them because they got tentacles and gills and all that stuff. And, um I'm not crazy about oceans, you know, like I kind of have a, a phobia. It's like one of those weird phobias. Yeah. yeah. Like, cause I don't like whatever could be like that. I can't see beneath me, you know? Gotcha. So, um, yeah, probably, you know, all of those things. And, um, I guess it's not highlighted as much, but he does kind of write from a place of experience with mental illness because like both his parents died in, institutions actually right so um yeah there's kind of a little bit of that too um so yeah all of it just kind of like i guess i related to all that stuff um so yeah that's, well so, you know that's you, kind of, you mentioned chadiana and mm-hmm, when we yeah. first met the first time i met you at, at one of the conventions that was the, the the book that you were you were selling at your at your uh, table. So tell us a little bit about Chariana, how how you came up with the story and where she is now. Oh, geez, well, then, you know that's like the longest story possible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, coming up with Chariana was kind of like I just feel like it was all over the place. Like I could, I've always said this. Like I'll mention in one interview a bunch of inspiration, mm-hmm. and then a different set in another interview. And it's not that, like, um, I'm dodging questions. It's just, like, it's all true, you know? Like, I feel like when I was coming up with her, there was just all the stuff that was inspiring me at the same time. Right. I know that I always wanted to do a female um, character. Um, 
And I remember probably as far back as reading Robert E. Howard, like, I was just thinking, like, well, you know, you have characters like Conan that are like this. And I know there's Red Sonia, but they don't get as much attention. So I remember just thinking, like, well, why can't there be a female character that's like this? That she's just, like, really badass and, you know, like, can fight well. And, you know, like, she would just be a cool character that anybody could be into. You know, it didn't have to be, like, a female audience, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, probably going back that far. And then I always had an interest in, um, in Indian culture. Mm -hmm. Um, and I remember when I was doing, so there was a painting I did called Goddess of Sand, which is, I guess, the first depiction of Chadiana. Mm -hmm. I was going to put it on my, um, banner when I did New York Comic Con and Artist Alley in 2011. So I was going to come up with, I, I figured I was going to represent like my two areas, right? Like I was going to do a horror piece and I did Count Orlock because like I'm just obsessed with Nosferatu. And I was going to do, I said, all right, well, at the time I hadn't done a lot of um, like art or writing that had like female character in it. So I said, all right, I'll do a female to represent um, the, uh, the fantasy part, right? Right, right? So I was... I was trying to figure out what I was going to do. And I said, well, all right, like, let's be a little candid. I was like, well, if I'm going to put a woman on my banner, why don't I just make it the type of woman that I would be attracted to? Not, you know, just your typical, like, big breasted right. white woman with blonde hair. So I was right. like, all right. So I did that. And um, that was a little bit of it, too, because what happened was, I guess the image was so stark to everybody and I guess appealing that they kept coming up to my table and asking me about the character on the banner. Yeah, because yeah, she's very just, <laughs> Yeah, so I just yeah. kind of shrugged my shoulders and was like, well, I did it so I could get people to the table. I didn't come up with any kind of story. So I guess since I had already had the idea of doing this female character and then I mean, I was just drawing inspiration from all kinds of things, whether it was uh, music and movies and video games and stuff I was reading, um, biographical and autobiographical stuff. And I just like, it all just kind of like started churning into this, like, you know, whole story and everything. It started out, I was just going to do one graphic novel that was going to be, um, just pretty, um, uh, how do I put it? It was just going to be like quick and fun, like maybe like four issues, you know, right. But as I started writing out ideas, it always with me, it gets darker and heavier and it starts getting bigger. And, you know, right. it just started to be, I mean, it's the only character other than my webcomic Gentleman Cthulhu where it's just like, every time I think like maybe I've explored every idea I could with her, mm -hmm. I get like 10 more, you know? Right. So, um, and of course a lot of that work still has to be done as far as like getting the stories out. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, such it is with comics, you know, it's so labor intensive. But of course, well, how many stories do you have plotted out for Chariana? Well, um, at this point, I mean, if you count in the Company of Shadows, which had kind of an unfortunate life, and I—that's the graphic novel I was doing right. through uh, Rosarium Publishing, which I'm going to get back to uh, if there's any like fans listening to this. It's not like I ditched it. Right. I mean, it is kind of her origin story. Yeah. Just at the time I was working on it, it just, I had so much else going on in my personal life that I could not give it the attention it needed. Mm -hmm. And I felt like the story started falling apart. Right. Um, since then, you know, I mean, like I, I spent the, maybe a year back, but like for two years, I spent a lot of time developing it developing my uh writing and art to a point where i feel like i'm pretty confident in it, no matter what i'm gonna do so i will get back to in the company of shadows yeah. um i want to do some other things first so right now there's the first issue which has two stories in it you could count in the company of shadows even though it's like in progress um there's another two issue that i wrote some years ago with that um I plan to get out, but that's not the next thing I'm doing. And then um, the project that I have going right now, which I've hired some artists to help me out with because I'm juggling a lot of projects. 
right, right now. Yeah. Um, I'm still doing some of the art for it, but there's going to be, um, I think by the end of it, there's going to be 12 stories. Okay. And, and they're going to be so, like I mean, 22 it's, it's gonna pages be, or like, are they, no, no, no. So not that. Amount? So, okay. right. So, um, I figured this came about a while ago when I was working on the, in the company of shadows, I read that, um, cause like I put so much work into my art and it's usually, uh, watercolors and it's done by hand. I can still work pretty much as fast, uh, traditionally as I can digitally, but still it takes time. Uh, so I remember reading, um, and now they've stopped the series, but the walking dead did 20 page issues. And I know it's The Walking Dead, but I was thinking, well, if they can get away with it, I can cut two pages out um, and still be able to tell a story. So most of the issues will be 20 pages, but not all of the not all of the issues are a full story. So there's going to be three 20-page stories, and the other two issues will collect like three shorter stories. Gotcha. And then I have two stories that I'm, oh, well, one is going up, I, oh, I forgot about that. <laughs> uh, one's going up as a webcomic, so there's a four-pager that I've got two people working on for, it's going up on Diwali this year, which is uh, Sunday, October 27th. Okay. So that's going to be up on chadiana.com, and then there's another two that are only going to be collected in the trade. Right. So yeah, that gets me to about 12, I'm pretty sure. Nice, man. So what, when, when do you expect yeah. some, I mean, I, I, the web comic will be up, you said, the 27th, right? So yeah, on the 27th, it's just a four-pager. It's kind of, um, it, it's kind of like a, a odd one. I wouldn't say like it's a full, like, story even. It's kind of this vignette, but it, it works well as kind of relaunching, so to speak, Chadiana. Right. Um, it's a nice little piece. And then... Um, the first issue I'm looking to get out in the first quarter of next year. Okay. All right. So, and that'll be with me and two other artists with some shorter pieces. Nice. And then I want to do the three full issues and then another, uh, one issue that's got three shorter pieces. And then, but then you also have this year, I, I, I mean, you have a lot of stuff going on, but you also have a kid's book, right? And you have, yep. right. And you, well, you have the, the web comic, obviously, um, but, mm -hmm. you, but you also have, um, what was it, the, um, what was the title of the, the black and white cover that you have out? Oh, the Tainted Ones. The tainted yeah. Ones. Yes. yes. Right. Yes. So what, the, that's um, one of the projects that, so what happened was, going back to Chariana and the Company of Shadows, mm -hmm. since that was kind of falling apart, um, you know, and I kind of, well, I didn't just kind of, I, I stopped working on it. Um, and started, like I said, developing my storytelling and uh, my art a little bit more and kind of taking a break from everything. I developed a couple of projects that were just kind of to keep me working and to kind of practice things on, but without, you know, going right back into Chadiana. So the Tainted Ones is one of those. Um, I have this friend, a uh, writer friend that's based out of Massachusetts, uh, Eric Bradbaum. He um he did this four pager called um oh god I'm gonna get it wrong now <laughs> uh Voodoo Bird I think it was this black and white comic but he said he was selling hundreds of them Jeez. you know it was the only comic he had he was looking to do more work right but he was like you know anybody can just drop like two dollars on your table and they get like a full story right. you know yeah 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 and I was. And when I was coming up with the Tainted Ones, I kind of had the same thing, except I wanted to really do like a knockout job with the art. You know, I was like, well, I could concentrate on some backgrounds more, do some a more visual storytelling where it's not necessarily in the narrative or the uh, character dialogue, but looking at the visuals, you kind of piece things together. So yeah, I did this like eight page thing that's all black and white, but I worked on it for months just right. trying to make like i didn't rush anything yeah, yeah, yeah. um yeah, yeah, yeah. and that was that one it's a it's a horror piece right. um i'm still waiting for comiXology to approve it 
Oh, okay, so they haven't turned down. Yeah, they haven't turned down anything I've put to them yet. So. Good for you. So, you, so a lot of the stuff that we've talked about today, other than the Robert Phillips, you can find mm-hmm. it on uh, Comicsology. Right. So, so any of my comics I have on Indie Planet and Comicsology, I'm also looking into drive-through comics because mm-hmm. I know some people have used that and it's been. It's been good for them. In fact, even even Valiant and I think IDW uses drive through. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, and then um, yeah, and then there's of course uh, any of my books I've got through Amazon and and Barnes and Noble, um, and probably any of my my trades once I get some collected uh, trade issues together. Those will be, you know, through the same. Uh, same online sellers plus the comic sellers so that'll be pretty spread out dude that's awesome and and you have your own publishing company right uh dark fire press right yeah so um yeah i'm publishing under dark fire press which is mine i that came about because when i was doing the uh trade collections for gentleman cthulhu mm-hmm. uh which is my web comic i was thinking like okay well maybe it would be good to have an actual publisher behind it. Right. Um, cause I don't like to do anything halfway, you know, it's, I don't want to be publishing as myself, even if I am publishing myself, you know, I feel like I got to have a proper company behind it. So, uh, yeah, I, last year I registered the LLC, but I had been using the label for, I guess about a year before that. Gotcha. Um, yeah, and then I just figured it was better to do it that way than, you know, on Comixology and Amazon, it just says, well, published by J.M. DeSantis, and, you know, right. probably, like, 50% of the people just decide to cluck out then. Right, right. <laughs> so, you know. <laughs> exactly. No, that's yeah, awesome. but it's, yeah, but it's, it's going pretty good, because I've already, it's funny, because I started it up, mm-hmm. and actually, the guy who helped me get the, um, the signing at Barnes and Noble oh, said, because okay. I had been running ads, and he said to me, he actually had heard of the company, and then when we got to talking, he didn't even know it was mine. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> you know, so somehow he had heard of it, and he even heard one or two people somehow even saying good things about it. So I guess Gentleman Cthulhu had, was doing something good. Awesome, man. But uh, yeah, and then I've had a few. Um, at least people I know um, approach me about publishing their stuff, which, right. you know, it's just kind of like, well, yeah, I mean, if it's going to be an actual thing, then I don't want it to just be me. So, okay. yeah. Uh, so I'm good. working, yeah, I'm working on that too with a few people, um, you know, and I'll, I'll let it grow a little bit at a time, you know, just okay. take on a few, see how it goes and, you know. Sweet. So, so the so, missions are not open yet. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. So people shouldn't start flooding you with, uh, with no, requests no. and things. Like, not yet. All right. No, cool, cool. please don't. Good. Yeah, I'm like I'm I'm one guy, and I'm still trying to concentrate on my writing and my art career. So yeah, it's not. Uh, I have a submissions page that specifically says submissions. Are not open. Uh, okay. Good. All right. So, yeah. so listen, I mean, I can talk to you all night about this thing, Jay, but we're running a little bit out of time. Um, where can they yeah. find your stuff? Okay. So I mean, the best. Two places to go are uh, my name, jmdesantis.com, because um, that has links to both uh, merchandise sites I have, because I'm up on the Vassal in uh, Society 6 with merchandise, and then uh, all my books are li- uh, listed in my books and comics. But if you just want books and comics, you can also just go to darkfirepress.com, okay. and that's got everything up that at least I've put out myself So. Yeah, those are the two best ways. And all my social media links are on jmdefantis.com. Perfect. You know, perfect. So, yeah. Well, listen, thank you so much for being our first guest here on the I Am Spotlight section of uh, of uh, Catch the Craze podcast. And You're welcome. I'm just sorry I talk so much because no, you dude, can't get is, enough questions. <laughs> <laughs> this is perfect, man. Yeah. And we're definitely going to have you back um, as we, you know, what, what do you want to say, evolve. Um, we'll definitely have you back and you can talk to us more about some of the stuff that we do because I, I want to talk to you about your writing method and how you come up. There's so many things I want to just talk to you about, but definitely we'll do it on the next time. Well, just give me one show per topic and I should be able to... <laughs> <laughs> <That's about laughs> <it. laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's great. Oh, man. Yes, we do yeah. appreciate you being on the show again. And uh, as to what George just said, um, down the road, uh, we'll, maybe we'll get you on a live show. Um, and, yeah, definitely. You know, so I think that, that'll that be really good just uh, even though we have – this is a pre-recorded show. We will have a video version of this, and they'll see yeah. your face. But it's also good for the people to interact, and uh, we can get some questions from our listeners as well on a live show um, and uh, go from there. Yeah, well, thank you guys for having me, of course. I mean, it's, uh, this is the first podcast I've uh, worked in both ways, you know. Sweet, yeah, definitely. First guest, first podcast, you know. <laughs> Thanks so much, Jay. Absolutely. Thank you again. And thank ha- you, guys. Have, have a good, good one, buddy. All right, take care. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> that was a nice little. So, I mean, there's a lot of questions you can ask this guy. Oh, um, absolutely. I, 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 as you were doing the interview, um, each time he spoke, I was like, all right, I know what I want to ask him next time. Yeah. I know what we want to cover I'm next time. You, there's so much. Uh, but, you know, it, it, you're right. You know, there's such a small window mm-hmm. um, that in time frame, but um, it's pretty impressive what he's doing um, you, to, to think of it. I mean, he's doing everything on his own. Yeah. And that was the question I, that I wanted to ask, and we didn't chime in time. It worked well with our topic well, today. we were talking about. He, Aspiration. He kept ma- yeah, yes. he kept mentioning the commitment. Even the commitment. When, even when he said he was going through some personal things, and that's why he had to stop doing a couple of things. And then once he got over that, he was able to create. And he's, I'm saying he's put out so much work since that time. It's, it's, it's not even funny. Like, it's just because of that. You know, like, right. you have to decide, okay, my commitment is this now, and this is what I'm gonna do. You know, it's yeah, it was kind of funny. Right. I, I mean, do you think thing. about it? I mean, I don't know how many. I mean, I can count. I can keep up. I mean, all the projects that he's doing, and I, I got exhausted. And I was like, <laughs> whoa! I was like, I don't think I've ever. I don't think a human being could put so much out. But um, he has novels. He has comic books. Yeah. He has web books. He's working with multiple um, people. Yeah. He's, he's publishing. Companies. He's self-publishing. Yeah. You know, he's managing yeah. his. You know, so. I think that's pretty impressive, and it w- fell in line. And he's the master of his fate. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you can't ask for anything more. Right. Um, you know, he's controlling his destiny. Uh, I think it was pretty impressive. Yeah, I think was it was great. a good first show um, with someone, an independent, who number one appreciates the arts, uh, and number two is committed to his craft. Yeah. I think it's it's also great how it tied into what we were talking about. Like without even us, you know, doing it, he kind of just it kind of just tied everything up. But yeah, no, definitely it was a, it was great, great, great for his first interview. Call me Mystic Mac because I predict these things. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the, the Conor McGregor. Uh, every every fight when he was at the height of his career, he would uh, he said, you know, call me Mystic Mike because I predict these things. Whatever he's he would say, I'm going to knock him out in this round or whatever it is. Um, no, I thought it was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, you know, and this is our first show, the comeback show with a guest. Uh, uh, although there's 156 shows available on. Uh, Apple Podcast and um, um, Google Play. Um, this is the fir- this is actually the second show that we've produced. We did a live show, right. and this is this first show with a guest. That's pretty correct. cool. Correct, correct. And then next week we're gonna have um, in the spotlight. We're gonna have Lewis Cruz, who is also an independent artist. He's actually he's actually handicapped. He uh, he's in a wheelchair, wow. but the dude is funny. He's a writer. He doesn't. He's not an artist, but he's a writer, and he writes. He's got a lot of stuff on Amazon. He's actually a stand-up comedian. Wow! Yeah, I saw a picture of yes, that. Yes. Yes. So he's very funny, man. He'll be he'll be on the show next week, so we'll have fun with that as well. Oh, that's pretty cool. And we will have um, live shows again. We'll announce the live shows Friday. The dates for the next live show. We're hoping to build some momentum and get you know we appreciate the um, the the listeners that. Uh, contributed and uh, engaged us in uh, the live show. Thank you so much. We're going to announce um, 
the next show, we're hoping to have even more people involved, and I yeah. promise to stay focused um, because I think I had ADD. You can't stay focused, <laughs> man. Stay focused. The minute you see somebody type something, oh, you just start, you just go to that topic. I was like a kid in cares, so I was like, someone likes us. Uh, so. Nah, it's dope, man. Yes. Nah, it's fun. Uh, like, listen, this is very. This is a lot of fun, bro. This it is. is a lot of fun, and it's you know, crazy. Hopefully, it's fun for you guys too as well out there. So yes, and I hope tune in next week for sure. Yeah, and hopefully you like the. Um, the uh, new transitions and uh, we hope to see you soon um, and again like us subscribe to us we're on multiple um, uh, platforms. channels platforms um, all that good stuff and uh, we hope to see you soon on um, on our live show we we'll catch the craze so peace thank you <laughs>